and we greatly appreciate his being a dad across the street. We thank the Lord for that. I'd like to encourage you to take your Bibles and join with me, please, in the book of Mark. I'm going to tell you right up front, I called it audible at the line of scrimmage. I have been prepared to come and give an exclamation point to Pastor Dave's messages concerning the church. I love the local church. And we need to be all about the local church, no doubt about it. But the Lord prompted my heart during prayer time that maybe that was not a fit message what I had planned for today. Not sure this is the proper one, but I feel like with world events, perhaps the church needs to hear something like this. So Mark chapter 13, that is 798 in the Pew Bible. Please, again, I beg your forgiveness. I'm reading from the King James, so you might have to mentally do some translating along the way. I apologize, not because I believe in the superiority of the King James. I grew up on it. It's like growing up on a certain diet. This is my diet. And so please, if you will allow me, beginning, please, in verse 29 of Mark chapter 13. So ye in like matter, the Lord is speaking, ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. Verse 30, I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and of that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not what the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taken a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh at evening, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. Ending with verse 37. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Would you bow with me, please? I'm going to ask that you pray first. Pray that the Lord would prepare your heart, pray silently, and then after a short period of time, I'll close that time by publicly praying. Let's pray, please. Father in heaven, I do count it a privilege to be here with these folks this morning. The church of God assembled. The church of God assembled for the express purpose to hear your word today. And I pray, Heavenly Father, as we come from our time together today, that we would be challenged by what your word says and desire to be obedient I do thank you, Father, for gospel life and, Father, for the ministry and the testimony that it has in this community. And perhaps that testimony will be expanded slightly tonight through the drunken treat. Pray that your will would be accomplished in that, that we would have opportunity upon opportunity to share your word. We thank you, Father, for the word of God, recognizing many countless countless countries across the world that are forbidden to even open your pages, one even as close as, uh, as to us as Canada. Father, I, I pray that we would count it a privilege to have your word. And Father, I pray again that we would take your word and seek to teach others and seek to incorporate it in our own hearts and lives. Again, we thank you, Father, for Pastor Dave and for the leadership of this church. And as he's laid aside, temporarily restore him. May he be rested up for the work that you've called him and the other leadership here of our church together to do. Thank you, Father, that we live in times 
not far into you. You're not fretting in the heavens. The Bible says that you rule and reign. And for that, we thank you. And Father, thank you for the privilege that we have to gain access to your kingdom, your throne, through the throne of grace, acknowledging what your son has accomplished for us in Calvary. We thank you, Father in heaven, for his death, your son's burial, resurrection for us. My prayer this morning, Father, if there's anyone here in this place that may not know by faith the Lord Jesus Christ, may not realize, Father, by faith that he died for their sins, I pray that this would be the day of salvation for them. We thank you, and we pray that the Holy Spirit would do a work. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Last time I was privileged to be here, I spoke from 2 Timothy chapter 3. And in that passage, we mention a verse in verse 1. It talks about, in the last days, crazy times will come. Perilous, it says in the King James. Roughly translated the same word that we would see in the Gospels. The maniac of Gadara. Maniac days will come. I mentioned at that time that I preached that passage to the people at Middletown Road Baptist Church when I was there, and I called it maniacal days. It's not maniacal days, but we are in maniacal days. That was in July, and from that point, we moved to maniacal days, maniacal days. I want to address that today. Somebody said once in a rock song, I never heard it, never listened to it, but it was torn my ear in growing up. The question was this in a rock song, does anybody know what time it is? And then the response, does anybody really care? I want to ask the church this morning, do you know what time it is? And do you care? The Bible talk about the men of David called the men of Issachar who had proper discernment of the times. They had so, the Bible says, that they knew what David ought to do. That ought to be the church of today. That needs to be our church. Discerning of the times to know what the church, God's people, ought to do. Just recently, I heard about the doomsday clock. Have you ever heard about the doomsday clock? That clock was around when I was a kid growing up. And they kept it at a certain time. Just recently, they pulled it out of wherever it was, the doomsday closet perhaps, I'm not sure. And they felt the need to readjust the time. Well, whoever does that determined that it was 90 seconds to midnight And in doing so, now this was months ago, not last month, months ago, in doing that, they determined that this is the closest to global catastrophe that it has ever been set at. Now, what's God's people to do? The Bible talks about when they came back from the land of Israel, the two spies, remember, plus the ten spies that went into the land The two spies had the minority report and said, we can go in with God's enablement. The ten spies had the majority report that says it's impossible. God condemned the ten spies because they, in their words to the nation of Israel, caused God's people's heart to melt within them. That's not my purpose today. My purpose today is is to encourage you that God is yet upon the throne. Amen? He still rules and reigns. Current events are not a surprise to him. He's not scratching his head saying, man, I wonder what I'm going to do. But as well, he has a word for God's people, and that's where I want to lead you today. What does God say how we should live in times like this? When I was growing up in my home, my parents took in foster kids of the state of New Jersey. And they took in one foster child. He was about 14, 15, a little bit older than some of the other members of the family. And he was rebellious to the core. I guess that's why he was a foster kid. 
And I remember passing by his room once again, a reference to rock music, again, I apologize, but in rebellion to what was allowed in the household, I heard these words. The Eastern world, it is exploding, violence flaring, bullets loading. You're old enough to kill, but not for voting. You don't believe in war, but what's that gun you're toting? And even the Jordan River has bodies floating. And you tell me over and over and over again, my friend, ah, you don't believe we're on the eve of destruction. Folks, God's word has something for us today, and I want to go with that. Note again in our passage in Mark chapter 13, verse 29, what is a Christian to do? And if I could pass on one word to you this morning that we should do, it's this simple word, watch. Note with me verse 32. Again, but of that day and of that hour knoweth no man, know not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, the Lord says to his disciples, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch, second time, ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh, at evening or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, verse 36, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping and for the third time. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Jesus is making very clear to us, his followers, his disciples. And he says, in these times, we ought to be people who watch. A little bit of background. The Lord is speaking these words. These words are actually, again, in the book of Mark. I'm sorry, Luke, and again in the book of Matthew. But the Lord is on the side of a mountain looking over to the temple mount. The disciples said, because the Lord said that's going to fall down. Forty years of construction, the temple mount and all that, the Lord says it's going to be coming down. So that piqued their interest, and they asked the Lord, tell us of the signs of thy coming and at the end of the age. And the Lord responds with the words that we have here called the Olivet Discourse. Think of it. The most profound prophetic conference ever held on earth. Well, we're afraid to, afraid to talk about prophecy anymore. When I was growing up, now third time I said when I was growing up, I apologize. But when I was growing up, prophetic conferences were the rage. We're afraid today because Honestly, no matter what opinion you have, and I'm not here to be divisive, honestly, I'm not, but whatever opinion you have, there are some puzzle pieces hard to fit together. I'm being honest. So instead of trying to work that out scripturally, we kind of stepped away from prophetic conferences, but the Bible says a lot about prophecy. Here is a prophetic conference, the so first portion what we did not read in the book of Mark, the Lord dealt with six major signs. We're not going to go there, but those signs were the soon coming of Jesus Christ, his second coming to earth, these signs. And the interesting parallel, you can find these signs if you study it out again in the book of Revelation. Again, we're not going there. But as you look at the record here in Mark's gospel, at the conclusion is where we are. We started reading in verse 29 previously, and the Lord talks about the parable of the fig tree. And of that parable, he says, this is how you recognize the time and nearness of my coming again. Parable of the fig tree. Now again, the parable's not using the fig tree as the nation of Israel. It's just simply the Lord says, when you see those leaves change, that's an indication that spring is coming, that, that summer is near. So the Lord using that as an illustration says this. So likewise, when you see these things, then he lists six things. Let me share the list with you. Deception, 
Do you see deception? War. Do you see war? Famine. Do you see famine? Pestilence. Do you see pestilence? That's the bugs, remember? And all those things that we read about in Egypt in the book of Exodus. Earthquakes. Do you see earthquakes? That is the Lord is saying, when you see these things, we ought to be looking for them. And then he says in verse 30, notice this, when you see these things, this generation shall not pass until all these things be done. In other words, the Lord is referring to the generation who sees those things. Folks, perhaps we're that generation. He's, uh, then what we ought to be realizing, those are the signs, and when you see these, that generation will not pass until he comes. We may be that generation that is seeing things, and then the Lord Jesus Christ might be coming back soon. I sang, fourth time now when I was younger. Do you remember this? Jesus is coming again. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, but surely soon. We're in the surely soon times. What I like to do is I encourage you with that word that I shared other, uh, previously. When you see this, we are to watch. Now, this is the essence of the message. Let me encourage you today. Watch at least these three different ways. They all start with a P, so if you can mentally put it together that way, that would be tremendous. First watch is this. Watch persistently. Watch persistently. That is, never stop watching. We have a dog at home, my wife's dog, not mine. It's a mini Australian shepherd. Energy, because she has the energy I don't. No, that's not true. You ought to see that dog when we put food down in front of him and maybe go left and right. He's not letting his eyes off that food. That's the way we need to be watching. And the Lord says, he says it that way. Watch persistently, giving an illustration. Note in the verses, verse 34, for the Son of Man is as a man taken a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. What the illustration is here. As the master of the house goes, he's taken a long journey, but he's given various members of the household different responsibilities. They ought to be done when I come back. He says, I'm going to tell you what to do, but he uniquely says, verse 34, tells the porter to watch. In that day and time, the porter was the gatekeeper, the doorkeeper. And what it did, or how they did it, was as other members of the household were busy doing their chores while the master of the house was away, the porter was to be at the door and awake. And what he was to do was to look for the return of the master so that he could alert the others while they were consumed with their work. I believe the church today is like that household in verse 34. The church, you and I. I believe the master, the Lord Jesus Christ, that's who he is. He left on the long journey to heaven, amen? And he's coming again. And as he left for that long journey to heaven, he gave instructions, verse 34 again, to you and I, the church. Matthew chapter 28, part of the instructions go, ye into all the world, teach all nations, baptizing them. That's the instructions that he gave. The epistles in the New Testament are further instructions to the church. In other words, God intended each and every Christian, those that are saved, those who came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, to live a pattern, according to Ephesians chapter 2, of good works. You and I need to be consumed of that. Likewise, 
The Lord gave us, if you know him as your personal Savior, you're a part of a local church, he gave you spiritual gifts. And those spiritual gifts are to be put to use within the local church, serving one another. That's the work our master gave us to do. May I remind you, Jesus has gone away. May I remind you, but he's given each and every one of us jobs to do. And we're to do them as though Jesus could return at any moment. Let me give you an illustration. Fifth time, when I was younger, my mom did errands Saturday morning. Grocery store, all those kind of things. She left, but before leaving, she would say, now I want this done, and I want this done, I want this done, I want this done, and I want this done. She left, we turned on TV. You got to remember, Saturday morning cartoons. I mean, I'm talking Rocky and Bullwinkle. I'm talking, well, they weren't cartoons, Three Stooges. I'm talking Clutch Cargo. No. But the point is, we sat down to watch TV. And the idea was, during the commercials, we quickly do whatever she wanted us to do. How many times, though, did she come home because we're so consumed in watching TV and she caught us not doing the jobs that we should have been doing? Much like that, verse 35, the Lord says, you watch for you know not when I am coming. And the Lord is talking about here a persistent watch. We don't know when he's coming. And sad to say, while we are about his business, need to be doing what he wants us to do, I believe largely the church, you and I that are saved, have failed to watch. Verse 36 continues. It says in verse 36, less coming suddenly he find you napping when he comes. Now that napping needn't be literal. It could be that we're caught up in other details. Let me give you an example of napping. If we're caught up in our own pleasures when Jesus comes, we'll be napping. If we're worrying about our own well-being before Jesus comes, we will be napping. If we are delaying service to the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes, think that I'll have more than any amount of time later on thinking about that additional time that we may have, we will be napping. In other words, if we're concentrating on our businesses, on our families, on our comforts, when Jesus comes, not that that is wrong, but it needs to be in balance. When Jesus comes, if we're concentrating on that, we will be napping. In other words, the point here is this. We should not be surprised if Jesus comes. We should have been expecting him. I should be expecting him because he told me to watch. So, what are you doing, dear Christian? Are you looking for the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, you might say it's not going to happen in my lifetime. Second Peter says it this way. The Lord is not slack concerning of his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. What Second Peter is saying is he will keep his word. He's coming again. Are you watching? Watch persistently. The next one is watch perceptively. I'll need you to take your Bibles and join me again in a different place, keeping your thumb perhaps in Mark chapter 13, but go with me to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, it's a pastoral epistle to Titus, and Paul is writing. Verse 11 is where we want to begin with, and I want to give you this part of it. Watch perceptively. Watch perceptively for the grace of God, verse 11, that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Note verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God 
and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Several things about that. Note verse 11, the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. I am thankful this morning for the grace of God. One day as a snot-nosed little kid, I came to know Jesus Christ in a bedroom basement. By faith, I trusted that he died on the cross for my sins. Nothing that I did, all that he did, the grace of God allowed that child to understand that. Folks, the grace of God has appeared to all men, all types of people. May I remind you, God's grace is God's unmerited favor. May I remind you that none of us here deserve forgiveness for our sins. None of us deserve a place in heaven. We don't deserve to be a child of God. But today, if you turn to Jesus Christ and you understand, believing that he died on the cross for your sins, you trusted him for, your, for forgiveness of sins and for eternal life, that's God's grace. And it's touched you. For by grace are you saved, Ephesians says, through faith and not of yourselves. It is the grace or gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Putting it simply, if you put your faith in Christ, then the grace of God is at work in your life. And among other things, verse 12 tells us that that grace is not departed but it continues to work within. Note with me, verse 12, that grace of God, verse 11, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. God's grace not only saves us, verse 12, but it teaches us. First of all, it teaches us to deny, and I pray it's at work in your lives, ungodliness. What is ungodliness? Ungodliness is anything that God would not do himself. It is anything that's not fitting or true of God. Ungodliness is also anything that we do without God. So if what I am doing is not dependent upon God or approved of by God, it is ungodly. Consider the words from John chapter 15, abide in me. And I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. Jesus said to his disciples by extension to us, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Verse 12 continues. I'm not only to deny ungodliness, but dear Christian, we need this today. I'm to deny worldly lust or desires. Amen? Oh, boy. Worldly lust or desires are basically anything that I do to excess. How do I deny worldly lust? I deny worldly lust by allowing God's Holy Spirit to control me. Ephesians 5 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So here, the grace of God teaches me to not only deny ungodliness and worldly lust, but as well teaches me to live soberly. It is about time that Christians are serious about their Christian life. If we live soberly, it means you will live seriously. That doesn't mean you won't have a uh, a, uh, sense of humor. I have too much of that. But it does mean that we will take our commitment to God seriously. Serious Christian lives seriously practices the things of God on a continual basis. See, largely we share or show our allegiance to God by coming Sunday morning, but that's just a small part of it. It's part of a bigger commitment that I need to have to Christ on a daily basis, walking with him every step, every moment of our life. Again, in verse 12, not only are we to live soberly, but righteously and godly are activities 
should be always right in the sight of God. Our activity should be the things that God would do if he were in our situation. Now, I'm coming back to watch, but note this. Grace of God, why does the grace of God do all these things? Brings me salvation, tells me about the my ungodliness, all those, listen again. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Note, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and our, uh, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What I'm saying as you bring those three verses together, if we live lives dependent on denying ungodliness, worldly lust, that if we live lives that are serious, righteous, and godly, then we will be perceptive enough to look for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That blessed hope in verse 13 and glorious appearing are one in the same. Are you looking for the wonderful coming of the Lord? It will be a perceptive thing that you do as you live for him day in and day out. Give you an example. Have you ever expected company and had to clean house? Folks, if you expect the Lord Jesus Christ that he could come at any moment, perhaps we need to clean up our lives Keep it clean on a daily basis. You look forward to his coming, so you live as though he could come at any moment. That was the second P. Watch perceptively. The Holy Spirit, as you walk in that spirit, perceptively you will note he is coming again. Last watch, going back to Mark chapter 13 just for a moment. Mark chapter 13, the last watch. I refer you in that chapter to verse 32 and verse 33, please. But of that day and of that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Then the closing words of our Lord, take he, ye heed, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. Watching and praying go together. The Lord commanded it here. It's also commanded all throughout the New Testament. Colossians says it this way. Continue in prayer and watch the same with thanksgiving. First Peter says it this way. For the end of all things that is at hand, be ye sober and watch unto prayer. Now let me share my heart for just a moment as though I haven't been doing that. But let me share my heart. We had five people to pray with us this morning. Folks, that room prior to our services ought to be blown out with people coming together to pray. We need to be a praying church more than what we are. And I'm not saying we're not a praying church. But we need to be more so. You heard the story. Charles Spurgeon had a vibrant ministry in the heart of London. Thousands were coming to hear Charlie speak the, Bi uh, the Bible. History says. Somebody asked, what is the success? Why is all this happening? Thousands were being saved. It was changing the London. And he took this group of visitors around to the church building. Eventually, they ended up into the basement, and there was a set of closed doors. The visitor said, what's the purpose of those doors? What goes behind there? And he goes, ah, that's the boiler room. And he opened the doors of that room and saw a host of people praying. Ah, oh, that we might open the doors of our church here 
and find a host of people praying that God would change our hearts as a church, that God would change our hearts in this community, that we would make a rich and deep impact for Christ where the Lord has said, have placed us. Watch and pray, dear church family. We need to grow in prayer. Note here, praying. Why does watching and praying go together? Praying helps us have victory over temptation. Praying keeps us spiritually sharp. Praying accomplishes God's purpose before Jesus comes again. Listen to the words of John 14. And whatsoever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And ye shall ask anything in my name. The Lord said this, do you believe it? That I will do. God doesn't want anyone to perish. The words of First Timothy says it this way. I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may continue to lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Paul adds then this as a commentary, for this is a good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Jesus is coming again. We're living in crazy times. What are we to do? Watch. Watch persistently. Don't ever let go. Keep on watching. Watch perceptively as the grace of God continues to work within our hearts and lives. And dear church family, watch prayerfully. And again, my, I understand Sunday morning schedules. They are crazy. I understand that. But let's use every available opportunity for this church to come together to pray. Let's pray together, please. Heavenly Father, the Lord is at hand. We really believe that. First, I pray, Heavenly Father, that we have not caused any hearts to melt here this morning. God is still in control. God still resides upon the throne of heavens. Father, I just pray that we would understand, perhaps, as we see the word of God and read it and watch news events, the Lord may be soon coming again. I pray, Father, that the this morning, we would encourage one another to watch persistently. Father, I pray that we would be about our Savior's work and business, do the task assigned to us, but keep our eyes because Jesus could come again. I pray, Father, that we would watch perceptively, knowing that the Holy Spirit, God's grace, has brought us to salvation and God's grace continues to work within our hearts and lives as we allow God's grace to do that, then perceptively we will understand what times we're in and may we watch. And then, Father, I pray that this church would watch prayerfully. We need the boiler room. We need people to come together to pray and to pray and to pray. Father, your, your word says, watch and pray. May we be obedient that way. I do thank you, Father, for the ministry of Gospel Life Church. I thank you, Father, for those in leadership, those that serve. And, Father, keep us a church growing, but only growing for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. We ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Uh, thank you, Pastor Jeff, for that encouragement and challenge.